If you lead, lead with your heart. It's the one thing you can trust. So uh, four years ago, we decided to go on a vacation to Disney World with uh, Madeline's family, uh, two little girls' uh, nieces going with us. Uh, just a Disney World vacation like any other family and we're down there and Maya um, over the course of a couple days starts uh, coughing a lot and it gets progressively worse and worse and you know like any typical guy I don't want to really take her to the emergency room but her mom's really starting to get pretty worried so uh, eventually we do take her in and you know she's, she's in there and you know, they, they do an x-ray of her heart and they, 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 we find out that her heart's um, the size of pretty much a nine-year-old and this is a, what, is she two years old at that 15 point? Fifteen months. Fifteen months old at that time and she's got a heart the size of a nine-year-old. And uh, they ended up having to, after a while, put her under sedation to let her heart recover. And she was under for quite a while and it was a very scary experience for us. It's, I think uh, you know, something we really don't want to ever have to go through again. It turned out her heart had gotten so weak that it could no longer pump on a regular cycle and they didn't know how often these arrhythmias would happen, how bad they would be and they needed to make sure the transplant was done before her lungs got to the point where they would not be able to handle a healthy heart. I can remember very clearly when we were driving Maya to her transplant it hit me so hard to think that another family who had just lost their child who was very small to a tragic accident was able to look beyond themselves and think of another little baby out there who was in need and donate their child's organ to Maya. I mean, it was just amazing to me and it really hit me hard and I sat back for a second even before the transplant thinking how amazing that two people would be able to agree to do that for somebody they never knew. And although her heart is doing so wonderfully, unfortunately a transplant does not last for life. Uh, the doctors have told us that in the near future uh, she could need a new transplant. So Ma um, Madeline's sister Misha and I were talking and we were like, it's, it'd be great if we could do something with a foundation dealing with hearts. Uh, something that we, I knew that my, my wife Madeline would be happy to, to be involved in and we'd all be involved in. We didn't know how much, but um, the big, big driver for me personally was we, you know, you finally are so happy that your heart transplant worked out great for your kid. And then you, you hear the next part of the news is, oh, here's all the medications that they'll have to be on. And oh, by the way, a heart transplant's not a cure for life. It's just kind of a, a bridge that lets you, you know, live until you need the next heart transplant so to learn I don't think most people know this but a transplant organ doesn't last forever and you're gonna have you know two three sometimes even four transplants in, in your shortened lifetime so we uh, started Enduring Hearts with the mission to enhance lives by funding research to increase the longevity of heart transplants now that we found the organization it's it's what are we doing it's we're, we're doing everything we can to get the message out and really raise the awareness of the organization I think one of the first things we've seen talking to people is that you know one in they don't realize that a transplant doesn't last forever they don't realize that one in four kids after five years who had a heart transplant are, are going in and getting another heart transplant using Facebook and other social media we've been able to spread the word about enduring hearts and you know, to the point where we were able to raise enough funding to actually fund our first uh, research grant, or at least we've approved our first funding for a research grant. And, uh, you know, from there, we're just going to keep on working, raising awareness, raising additional funds, and hopefully get to the point where we're really making an impact uh, on the future of um, research in this area. So there's all kinds of ways to help out there in Hearts. We, you can donate funds, you can donate your time, you can just simply spread by word of mouth about Enduring Hearts. Or what's most important to us and dear to our heart is uh, make sure you're registered to donate organs because um, as Madeline said earlier, <laughs> our daughter wouldn't be here if it wasn't for someone doing that. Hello everybody, I'm Van Earl Wright, joined by Dr. George Nicholson here at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta talking about the role that Enduring Hearts plays in the research for pediatric heart transplants. Just wanted to ask you about Enduring Hearts and the role that it plays in your work. 
How does it benefit your work with kids who are facing heart transplants? Well, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to provide funding for new research um, to advance the field, uh, that which is a definite need within the field of pediatric heart transplant and pediatric heart failure in general. Um, so it is a fantastic opportunity to continue to advance the field forward. And one of the misconceptions I think that does exist is the necessity for longevity of a heart transplant. How will enduring hearts benefit in that area? Well, primarily now, if you look at a lot of the research that is being done in heart failure and transplant, most of it is in the adult population. Mm. And the long-term outcome when you're talking about an adult compared to a child is drastically different, with the main difference being the longevity, as you mentioned, of the transplanted organ. When we transplant a child, you know, we're not looking for five to ten years down the road. Right now we are because that's just where the, the research currently is and that's where the field is. But our ultimate goal is to see 30 to 40 years later how is that transplanted organ doing. And that's the hope of the society and of this charity is to provide funding for research to address just those questions. Uh, I think because Enduring Hearts is born from a family's experience, uh, the foundation has a laser-like focus on one goal and that is to allow children who've received heart transplants to keep those hearts and live as normally as possible for as long as possible. We made tremendous advances in the 1960s and 70s in terms of getting the body to accept the heart transplant. Mm -hmm. But the sad fact is that it's still, on average, those hearts only last about 13 to 15 years. Over time, the body recognizes that it's not itself and mm -hmm. attacks it. But I think there are a lot of breakthroughs elsewhere in science that we can leverage to make that heart last several decades. And that's really what Enduring Hearts is focusing on, getting the, the heart to really stay with that child for a long time. And so we're out there gonna be looking for the best ideas to help us move that forward. Tell us, from your perspective, the importance of having an organization like Enduring Hearts focus solely on the research for this very important aspect of medical care for, for kids. So we have a lot of groups that help raise money for heart research related to children, and even some related to heart muscle weakness or heart mm -hmm. transplantation. But Enduring Hearts has a laser-like focus on trying to allow the children who've had heart transplants to live as long as possible with that heart. We've had tremendous breakthroughs in the 1960s and 70s with heart transplant science, but we've kind of hit a roadblock since then, and we really need to push ourselves to the next level. There's no reason why a heart transplanted child couldn't last 30 or 40 years if we get the science right. Uh, we still have worries in the long term that her body will slowly, slowly reject that heart. Mm -hmm. And while she lives every day like another child, in the back of our minds we worry that her body is recognizing it as someone else's heart. And we have to really get the body to somehow accept that heart as part of its own. Uh, we're trying to do several things. We're trying to get the best scientists uh, and the best ideas in the country brought to our group. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're looking for real breakthrough ideas that we can either catalyze to take into something bigger where other groups could help us out or that we could fund fully on our own. So our number one goal is to get great ideas put before us. Our second goal is to take all of those ideas and pick the ones that have the highest promise of, of making major transformation in how we care for kids. So the latter part is something we're probably more comfortable mm -hmm. with. We can tell good science from, from stuff that will just marginally move things along. What we really need to do is get the best ideas out there in front of us. We are now joined by three nurses, Renee, Kathy, and Nicole, who work with the Pediatric Heart Transplant Division here at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And the first question that I want to throw out there to you ladies is, what was the experience like working with Maya and the Gann family? Uh, Maya's family was really wonderful to work with. Mm -hmm. They were always around. They had extra family come in if they were ever going to be away for a weekend or a night. Um, going into her room was like going kind of like to Disneyland. Her room was completely <laughs> decorated wall to wall. She had toys everywhere. Her drawings were everywhere. Um, and they were always really welcoming to have people come in. Mm -hmm. um, even if you weren't necessarily their nurse that day, you could go in and say hi and play with her for a while and um, kind of just make her life a little easier. Uh, we're very big into normalizing their lifestyle so they can kind of just still be kids while they're here. So it was we great. commented that Maya was one of the smartest little kids that we ever took care of. Mm -hmm. There was always mm -hmm. a story that came out of her mouth and we would go into her room and um, she, just, she just lit up the whole unit and she was there. She really did. 
I think for the pediatric population in general, it's the most resilient patient population that you could possibly take care of. These kids can be so incredibly sick, yet they still just want to be kids. They want to play. They want to have fun with you. So I come to work, and it, yeah, it's my job, but it still is coming to work and having fun at the same time. Yeah. So you have the benefit of caring for them you know, as a critically um, sick patient, but at the same time just treating them like a child. Lead with your heart It's the one thing you can trust To always come from love